So if you all will remember, we all were going through some of the quiz as well. So some of the questions. So one of the important questions, especially in the ECG always is the differentiation of the tachycardia. And then even in that, what happens is a lot of times we get confused for the wide QRS tachycardia with, is it a ventricular tachycardia or is it something else? So that's where the lot of times confusion is there. And in fact, one of the other confusion is whether it is SVT with aberrancy. So what happens is a lot of times we may come across ECGs showing a bundle branch block pattern and in which the morphology is similar to the broad complex tachycardia. So in that you will also try to have to look on some of the signs which I had already mentioned. So the, can anyone recall what are the signs which I had already said will be pointing for the VT? For example, if you see it over the, here in the ECG, what are the signs which favor VT? So what happens is you should try to see further different deflections over here. So if you if you put them in different parts like this A, B, C, so if the first part start from the Q or till the first deflection, if it is more than 30 milliseconds, it tends to favor VT. Similarly, if there is a notching in the S wave, it tends to favor VT again. Similarly, if the whole QRS to the nadir of the S wave, if it is more than 70 milliseconds, it will be again VT as well. So what do you see in this ECG? If you see come across an ECG like this, what will you call it as? So this is AVNRT but with left bundle branch block and why did I say? I will give you the answers but you must give the logic as well. So at least the, I'll give you the questions, I'll give you the answers as well, but at least the logic you have to say. So why did I say it like this? Because if you see carefully, this is definitely left bundle branch block, right? Seeing from the V1 to V6. But if you will notice carefully, what do you notice over here? What do you notice at least in the lead one is, there is a S wave, right? So there is what is called a short RP interval. In the short RP interval, the most common diagnosis will be AVNRT, in fact. So this was a young female patient with this tachycardia. If you come across a young female, a young female patient with tachycardia, up to 70% of the times, this is going to be typical AVNRT. What about this ECG? So what do you notice? So if you really look carefully, especially in the lead 2 or the rhythm strip which is there in the lowest uh, segment of the page, you will see there is AV dissociation, right? And that's why they superimpose P waves, especially in the lead V1. And that is why if you come across an ECG like this, this is ventricular tachycardia. How about this ECG? What do you see? So what do you notice in this ECG? So you notice is this is our right bundle branch block, but there is also Q wave in the inferior leads. Right? So what does it mean? So what do you notice is, as I had already said it is, there is a prior inferior infarction. QRS is slightly prolonged. There is RBBB as well, but there's P wave before all these waves. So this is more of a sinus tachycardia, right? So what about this ECG? What do you notice? So there's already a rhythm strip below. So what do you notice in this? Hello? Yeah? Hello? Yes, got 
start so that is now doctor your voice was good oh okay okay sorry so what do you notice in this ecg so in this ecg as i already have shown the diagnosis is avrt but why avrt so if you will look carefully there is a void qrs but there is p wave after all the qrss isn't it so vr dissociation is not seen and then what else do you notice the rp interval is more than it's a long rp interval right so that is why it will be avrt so how about this ecg so in this ecg you can see it carefully already is there is a paste wave is present over here and then what happens so what is happening is you see a right ventricular paste wave and why did i say it like this because there is a left bundle branch block right and of course you see the you notice those spikes as well and other than that what happens is the r wave is more than 40 milliseconds the rs interval is also longer there is also qrs complex and this ecg try to look carefully what do you notice over here so you notice is the axis is changing each alternate beat right and of course there is some qs wave as well from v1 to v4 with left bundle branch block pattern so when the qrs axis is changing so this is characteristic of what is called as bidirectional ventricular tachycardia and mostly it is seen with digoxin toxicity and in fact a lot of those patients who are having the, what is called as familial catecholaminergic polymorphic vt those patients will be having all these things and now in this ecg so what is happening actually if you look at the rhythm strip same thing is happening the axis keeps changing with the alternate beat but what is happening is ectopy is different and when we try to look carefully for the history the patient was having taking digoxin and in this ecg what is happening over here so this is a patient who had already go underwent thrombolysis after the thrombolysis was done this ecg was seen so this is characteristic of ventricular scape rhythm so this is not ventricular tachycardia and yes the you also notices what is called a sinus pause arrest because there is a single p wave which is uh, which is visible only on the 6 second rhythm strip the broad complex type cardia which is seen at the this rate in fact and how about this ecg what is happening over here so there is already a qrbbv pattern and there is right axis deviation so this is a patient so the rr interval is very much fixed there is fixed pp interval as well so this is what is characteristic of complete heart block with a ventricular escape rhythm so with a third heart degree block and now in this ecg
you need to try you need to understand the mechanism as i said it you may be able to know the answers from someone else but if you understand the logic next time you will not be able to write wonderful anga balagan wonderful dr balagan very nice so why you think it is complete hard block so what is happening is of course the, you notice is there is fixed rr interval but there is pp interval is also fixed but they are running independent of each other isn't it and also you try to look at the morphology so what is happening is in the v1 you see is q r b v v pattern right so that is why it is a complete hard block with ventricular escape rhythm and this ecg what is happening so i would really say to look at the lead 2 if you're going to look at the rhythm strip lead 2 you'll be noticing something interesting so we had already spoken in the last session was our approach how should it be try to look out for the rate rhythm axis are the p waves following the qrs or not or where is it you should try to spot the qrs and that's what is going to help you so seeing this what do you think now so this is what is called as the sino atrial exit block and why is it said like this exit block and that on the level of sino atrial because you see over here there is failed propagation of the pacemaker So what do you notice in this ECG? So that's why I said it. What is happening over here is this failed propagation of the pacemaker impulses. That is the reason, especially beyond the SA node. So that's why it is called as sinoatrial exit block. And yes. So a lot of times, what may happen is it may be becoming a little bit confusing. in the sense like how to differentiate between sa exit block or with the different types of av block so what happens is you may not be able to see the initial sinus impulse on ecg but the relationship between impulse generation and transmission must be inferred from the p wave alone and only the second degree SA block, sinoatrial block, type one and two, can be diagnosed from the 12 lead ECG, right? So, now what is happening for this ECG? So, what do you notice? So, you notice is there is a second degree heart block because if you look carefully at the P to QRS ratio. There's a ratio of three to one, which tends to produce an extremely slow ventricular rate. Okay. So there is some relationship, fixed relationship. It is not like complete dissociation of the P and QRS, right? So. yeah sometimes you may also see the high grade av block which may be resulting from the mobitz 1 or mobitz 2 av block in fact so what is happening over here otherwise in the ecg which is i'm showing later on so uh, to make it easier i have also pointed out some arrows over there so what do you notice is in the other ecgs is pqrst 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 
right? But before that, after this P, the uh, the uh, the one with, where P, the arrow is marked. But after the P, you don't see the QRS. So what it is? Even in the lower ECG, if you look carefully, what is happening is this P QRS T. P, there's no QRS. Again, normal activity, normal activity. Similarly, it's happening later on for two beats. So what is happening? So this is what is called as the AV block. So AV block, back to second degree, so you, you can call it as Morbid's type 1, Morbid's type 2. So Morbid type 1, what it is is, there is intermittent non-conducted P wave without progressive prolongation. So what is happening in the AV block type 1? Does anyone remember type AV block A type 1? AV block type 1 was prolonged PI interval, right? Then was the AV block second degree. So which was of two types, Mobids 1, Mobids 2. Mobids 1 will be progressive prolongation of the PI interval and there will be a drop beat. Isn't it? Okay, so so what happens in the Mobits type 2? It's really important in the sense what is happening is the PI interval in the conducted beats is constant. But P wave, they have their own constant rate. And the PI interval, the RR interval surrounding the drop beat is the exact multiple of the preceding hour interval. So what it means is the hour intervals are happening at a constant rate, even including the drop beat as well. And yes, there may be no pattern to the conduction blockage. Alternatively, there may be a fixed relationship between the P and the QRS complex as well. So that is why Mobitz 2 is usually due to failure of conduction at the level of the his book engineering system. So it's a blockage which is present below the AV node. And while Mobitz 1 is usually due to non the functional suppression conductions, for example, due to the drugs or reversible ischemia, Mobitz 2 is more likely due to the structural damage to the conduction system. For example, infarction, fibrosis, necrosis, etc. Similarly, the patients who are having a typical pre-existing left mandible branch block or bifascicular block and the second degree AV block is produced by intermittent failure of the remaining fascicle, for, which is bilateral bundle branch block. In fact, in around 75% of the cases, the conduction block is located distal to the bundle of his, which causes broad QRS complex. And in the remaining 25%, the conduction block is located within the his bundle, which causes the narrow QRS complex. So unlike the Mobitz 1, which is produced by progressive fatigue of the AV nodal cells, Mobitz 2 is all or nothing phenomenon, whereby his Purkinje cells suddenly and unexpectedly fail to conduct a supraventricular impulse. So what is the mechanism? What is the mechanism for this? Mechanism, as I already said it is, the block is there in the conduction system below the AV node. So the lead uh, Mobitz 1 is of course happens is due to the functional suppression of the AV node itself, maybe due to the drug or due to the reversible ischemia as well. Similarly, the patients who typically have a pre-existing left bundle branch block or bifascicular block and second degree AV block is also produced by intermittent failure of remaining fascicle. So in almost 75% of the cases, the conduction block is located distal to the bundle of his that pr produces broad QRS complex. And in the remaining 25% of cases, the conduction block is located within the his bundle itself. Clinically, it is very important. And what is the reason is? The reason is because it can cause hemodynamic compromise severe bradycardia and also progress to complete heart block. So that is why if you come across a Mobitz type 2 patient which is clinically symptomatic, it is a better idea to put up a 
go for a pacemaker in fact. And yes, such kind of patients, the risk of asystole is very high. And that is why if someone is having morbids too, you must ask to get a cardiac monitoring done and maybe also a backup temporary pacemaking. And of course, maybe on a long-term basis, you can try to get a permanent pacemaker done. So what is happening in this ECG? Anyone would like to comment? So this is an interesting phenomenon, what is called as Ashman phenomenon. Ashman phenomenon, so what had happened, he observed was, in some of the patients with atrial fibrillation, when there's relatively long cycle, it tends to get followed by a relatively short cycle. And the beat with a short cycle mostly has a right bundle branch block. This is the one which tends to cause diagnostic confusion with the premature ventricular complex. And if there is a sudden lengthening of the QR cycle, the subsequent impulse with a normal or shorter cycle length may be conducted with aberrancy. So, did you notice? So, if we'll try to look retrogradely, a lot of things you may be able to appreciate is there is atrial fibrillation, but with atrial fibrillation, especially in these waves, so for example, when there is a long R I interval, it tends to get followed by a shorter R interval with a wide QRS beat, right? And it looks more like a, it always has a right bundle branch block morphology. So it may look almost like a PVC, but this is not exactly a PVC. Okay. So these are, okay, now coming to the PVCs or premature ventricular beat localization. So these are some of the beats which is seen in the different areas. So how will you localize? So for example, what do you notice? Why they all are RVOT areas? Because 2, 3 AVF is positive. But after that, what do you notice? So what do you notice is, if in the RVOT area, one is positive. So it will be the posteromedial wall. Right? Similarly, but the RVOT is a three-dimensional space. So in the sense, it has two areas like the left superior free wall. So there is an area like free wall, septal wall. Okay. But in the free wall as well, there is right superior and there is left superior. Okay. Right superior, left superior. Similarly, in the uh, the, uh, the septal wall as well. Right superior, left superior. Isn't it? So this is, this is how you should try to differentiate with this. So one of the other confusion tends to happen is for the fascicular VT or for example, especially the posteromedial papillary muscle. So how to differentiate for the fascicular VT is I hope you are already aware. So initially you will be seeing is a right bundle branch block. After the right bundle branch block, if you see a left axis deviation, it will be anterior fossicular. If you see a right bundle, it will be posterior fascicular. And if the axis is normal with VT morphologies, so this will be It will be what is called a septal fascicular VT. Now coming to the papillary muscle VT. So in the papillary muscle VT, how do you differentiate between the anterolateral and posteromedial papillary muscle VT? So you try to see is the V1. V1 is right bundle branch block. Okay. And then when you look carefully at the VT to V6, they all have a prominent S wave. And other than that, you also notice this 2, 3, 
two three AVF is all negative. Okay. And that is what tends to brings you to the diagnosis of this. So this is another example as well. So what is happening is of course there is a right bundle branch block pattern. So right bundle branch block means the origin is something there but from the left side. Okay. So now if it is from the left side, what else do you notice? There is inferior axis, right inferior axis. Especially in the lead one, if you will notice there is RS wave small r and big s in lead one and the ratio of r to s is less than one in v6 with a wide qrs and that is what indicates for the papillary muscle vt so i will try to also give you some of the insights a lot of people have been telling me so what are the things which we try to do especially during the ablation so this may be important in the sense so for example how these leads have been placed is initial leads are the surface ECG leads followed by HRA right atrium, the his ECGs, coronary sinus and after that is the ablation. But in the ablation if you look carefully just before the uh, this complex what do we notice there is a highly fragmented area which is called as the Purkinje potential but this potential may also come later on. So for example, in this ECG as well, when it comes to this segment, it will be called as the reverse of Purkinje potential. So this is what when what happens is when you try to use a 3D mapping system as well. And when you notice a late potential, you can just go and burn over there. So this is again trying to use a 3D mapping system and trying to localize, especially for the ventricular arrhythmias. So there has been several studies as well when they try to locate what are the areas compared to the fascicular VT where, where from the papillary muscle can or originate. So some of the, the most common areas what they noticed was inferomedial area of the papillary muscle and sometimes also in the anterior wall. So that is why it is called as anteromedial or posterolateral. Okay. So a lot of times, uh, yeah, fascicular arrhythmias may look similar to this, but they are of course very different. And uh, especially for ablation of the papillary muscle, you may use a ice, intercardiac echo as well. So how to differentiate between the anterolateral and posteromedial? So then for that you will have to look at the morphologies. Okay, and then you can of course differentiate. So what happens is the papillary muscle VT should always be considered for the ablation. So but yeah, okay, one of the someone has already asked like how to differentiate between the those uh, anterolateral and posteromedial papillary muscle VT. So there is always a RBVB as I already said it. Then you should try to look at the axis. How about the axis? If the axis is inferior, this is anterolateral. And, and if it is superior axis, then it will be posteromedial. Okay. Similarly, Although you may notice is there is absence of the QS pattern in the limb leads, there is also absence of the typical pre perpendicular potential, which is like P1, P2, but these are mostly used for the ablation of such arrhythmias. Okay, so anterolateral, posteromedial, don't forget what I had said. So, what I had said was you try to look at the axis. If it is posteromedial, it will be superior axis, if it is anterolateral it will be inferior axis right and you can also look for the r to s axis as well so in the one in the posterior medial axis is more wider yeah and yes uh, so what do you notice it now in this ecg
So what do you notice in this? So what happens is, this is like a, so try to look at the rate, rhythm and axis. Exactly, okay, 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 you are almost going towards the right diagnosis. And then, <laughs> so this is what is characteristic of, okay, you were almost there. So it was characteristic of hemorrhage, subarachnoid hemorrhage. So for example, if you see cross, gross big T inversions from V1 to V6, this is what will be at all the leads if you see. So this is characteristic of subarachnoid hemorrhage. And of course also the QT interval is also prolonged. And now in this ECG is, so what is, this is what is the characteristic Wellens sign. Why it is called as Wellens sign? So Wellens sign is characteristic of proximal LED occlusion. And what is happening over here is there is symmetrical deeply inverted T acute anterior MI. So you should not forget this sign because the, what you notice is a symmetrical deeply inverted T wave it, and it was seen in a patient of acute anterior MI, anterior wall MI. And on this, what is happening? So you already notice what is called as there is a right bundle brand block pattern with ST elevation, especially in V1 to V3, with concave ST variants. This kind of ECG, if you look in someone, it tends to increase the chances of risk of sudden cardiac death and which mandates urgent ICD implantation. And this ECG, so what we notice is V1R is tall, pretty tall. So this is more of a right bundle branch block. PR is short, right? So you see delta waves as well. Oh no, this is not Brugada. So this is exactly, now you're right. This is WPW. And where is the exact localization for the ECG? I already gave you all a hint. RBB means on the left side. On the left side now. What else? This is left lateral. Okay. So this is due to the accessory pathway as I had said it. And yes, uh, if you do the ablation for this, uh, that's the best because some of those uh, ablation uh, accessory pathways, they can conduct the atrial arrhythmias to the ventricle, tach ventricle. And that's the one which tends to increase the risk for such arrhythmias. I had already shown you this ECG, right? So this is what is happening is Mobids 2 block. Why Mobids 2? Because there is constant. If you look carefully at the PP intervals, they are all fixed. But what is happening at RI intervals are also fixed. But whenever there is a mixed beat, missed beat, those intervals are almost fixed. But they are twice the normal of the RI interval. So now what is happening over here? PR is prolonged, right? And what happens? So this is what is characteristic phenomenon of Wenke back. Wenke back means PR interval gets prolonged, prolonged, and there is a missed beat. And yes, uh, you need to follow up these kind of patients, but they may less likely to progress to the complete heart block. So this is another interesting ECG, what is called as Garbosa criteria. So what happens is whenever you are pacing or the patient already has a pre-existing bundle branch block or a paced rhythm, 
and you have to detect myocardial infarction. So that is when you should try to see. And what is Garbosa criteria is, for example, in the concordant leads, concordant leads, for example, on the same side. For more than one lead, if it is more than one mm on same side, it will be positive. Similarly, if more than one lead of V1 to V3 with more than one mm of concordant depression on the same side, if there is depression. And on one lead anywhere with more than 1 mm ST elevation or 25% of the depth of preceding S wave. Oh, okay, Takasubo. Uh, yeah, this is more of a. You can also see the ECG, but of course, the echocardiography or the angiography is more of a. Uh, Characteristic for the Takasubo syndrome, in fact. And the hyperkalemia, uh, ECGs are very important because on the basis of the production levels, you may be able to see those changes in the ECG and which are important in the sense, severe hyperkalemia is defined, of course, more than seven, moderate more than six, and hyperkalemia if it is more than 5.5. So if there is a patient which comes to you with a new bradyarrhythmia or AV block, especially those patients who are having renal failure or even hemodialysis, or the patient who's someone who is taking ACE inhibitor, potassium sparing diuretics, or even potassium supplements as well. So that is when hyperkalemia tends to happen. But if there are patients more than seven milliequivalent, you may notice conduction abnormalities and bradycardia. Curious will be prolonged and there may be bizarre curious morphology as well. So any kind of bundle, bundle branch blocks or conduction blocks as well are seen with those conditions. Similarly, if the patient's potassium level exceeds 9 milliequivalent per liter, patient can develop cardiac arrest, leading to asystole, ventricular fibrillation, even the pulseless electrical activity. So what is happening in this ECG? This is the classical sign. What is happening? So what in the first one you notice is there's peak T waves. Later on, PR segment is prolonged. And the last one, you don't see P waves at all. So these are associated with all hyperkalemia. And now in this, prolonged PI intervals, there's broad and bizarre QRS complex, which tends to merge with the preceding P wave and of course the subsequent T wave as well. And, and when we try to investigate this patient, we saw the potassium levels were to the tune of 9.2. What is happening for this patient says, this tall symmetrical peaked T waves. And in this, this prolonged PI interval. Of course, with wide and bizarre QRS, again, it had happened in case of hyperkalemia. Now, in this ECG, what is happening? So, this slow junctional rhythm with intraventricular conduction delay, peak T wave as well. Now what is happening in this ECG? So there is definitely broad, complex left bundle branch block morphology is left axis deviation as well and P waves are not seen. So that was again for a case of hyperkalemia. And this patient, broad complex tachycardia, right? And then we try to do a potassium analysis and we notice like potassium levels were almost 9.9. 
And this patient with huge peaked T waves. So which is called a sinus wave appearance for a patient who had severe hyperkalemia. But that patient was having secondary to rhabdomyolysis. So thank you so much for all the patient hearing. I would like to answer if you guys are having any questions or any confusions.